Hello everyone, uh, this is the second module of the lecture on the microengineering devices that can be used to acquire signals uh, from brain. So, we say it is a biopotential. Uh, we uh, know what is difference between EEG and uh, uh, IEEG right. We also know what is ECOG. So, as discussed uh, in the last module ECOG is electrocartography when we take signals directly from the brain. EEG is electroencephalogram when you take uh, signals from scalp uh, and we have also seen about 1020 system right. Now, to develop uh, microengineering devices whether it is a surface uh, microelectrode array or it is a uh, uh, deep brain stimulation electrodes or recording uh, probes for from the brain uh, we need to understand how the fabrication process works and we need to understand that what kind of metals or materials are used for uh, designing the probes right. So, uh, one of the standard material that people use uh, is silicon and then over the silicon we use silicon dioxide. So, to understand how silicon dioxide can be deposited I have given a just a, a peripheral view, uh, viewpoint uh, of CVD techniques and CVD stands for chemical vapor deposition techniques. Now, since CVD we uh, have just understood that there are say ALD, PCVD, LPCVD, MOCVD and so on. Now, uh, the second aspect of it is the thermal operation or EBME operation or sputtering those things falls under physical vapor deposition. Now, we want to deposit a metal or deposit a semiconductor onto a substrate, substrate is any material on which you are going to uh, deposit several materials or design or develop a device or fabricate a device right. So, uh, if you want to uh, deposit a metal and you want to pattern the metal, patterning the metal will give us different shape of the electrode for finally, fabricating or realizing a device we need to understand PVD techniques. And uh, last time we understood uh, thermal e-beam and sputtering. Now, I told you that in within PVD techniques or within sputtering itself uh, there are four basic type of sputtering or for these divided into four broadly into four categories. The first one is called DC sputtering, second one is radio frequency sputtering, third one is magnetron and fourth is reactive ion sputtering. And in this sputtering um, uh, is uh, we have seen that it is not like uh, we are melting a, a, a source uh, material, but we are actually dislodging the atoms from the source material right. So, uh, it is a mechanical way of uh, depositing a film uh, compared to e beam or thermal operation. So, targets are available in various shapes uh, it can be disc, it can be toroid, it can be plates and different sizes. As an energetic ion strikes surface of material there are four possibilities ions with very low energies may simply bounce off the surface. Second is at low energy that is less than about 10 electron volt the ion can be absorbed or to the surface generating heat and about 10 kilo, kilo electron volts the ion uh, penetrates into the material may, may many uh, atomic layer spacings uh, and that is your ion implantation. So, if you you need to understand how to keep the energy right above or below 10 electron volts. Between these two ranges both energy transfer mechanism occur and the substrate atoms or uh, the clusters of atoms will be ejected from the surface of the substrate which energies uh, of within with the energies of 10 to 50 electron volts. So, that is the range in which we generally use sputtering this additional energy provides sputter atoms with additional surface mobility and finally, to improve the step coverage and it deposits on the substrate. So, compared to E beam and thermal operation if you go for sputtering the step coverage is uh, better. So, if you want to understand the yield of sputtering right uh, then you need to understand how many number of sputter atoms uh, versus how many number of incident ions. The higher the yield that is S is higher right that means better the sputtering efficiency sputtering yield. Sputter yield depends on 1 inversely proportional to the binding energy of the material that is S is inversely proportional to the binary, binding energy. Second it is proportional to square root of energy of ions how many ions are bombarded right. Uh, so, the sputtering yield is proportional to square root of the energy of those ions. It is proportional to the ion mass and target atomic mass 
it is proportional to the angle of incidence and finally, reduction in deposition pressure gives a better yield. So, uh, this uh, plots here shows butter yield the first one on the left side versus ion energy and you can see that as you keep on increasing energies butter yield increases at certain point it start saturating. And in this same thing here is sputtering yield versus angle of incidence is shown, here is sputtering yield versus pressure is shown right. So, uh, several factors comes into picture when you want to go for sputtering based deposition. So, again uh, there is a two different things one is a thin film uh, deposition another one is thick film deposition. So, if you know screen printing right by which our greeting cards uh, were initially uh, produced uh, those screen technique techniques uh, can be considered as a thick film technology. By thin film deposition we have spin coaters we have physical vapor deposition and we have chemical vapor deposition. And you can see very clearly that if you have a, a pits then this pit can be covered with PVD, uh, but there is a, a, a complete, complete step coverage may or may not be available when in CVD it is for sure that you can cover the complete step. The reason is because the gas reactants will react with the uh, with different parts of this particular pit compared to PVD techniques because there is a shadowing effect. So, physical deposition uh, uh, or physical transport of material from a source to substrate. Uh, example of PVD is evaporation or sputtering. There is a no chemical reaction is involved, there are no byproducts and generally processed after creating very high vacuum there is 10 to the power minus 6 torr and there is a poor step coverage. In CVD which is chemical vapor deposition, CVD is a chemical process used to produce high purity, high performance solid materials. CVD is used to deposit silicon and dielectrics good film quality is uh, obtained using CVD and finally, the step coverage is also good. So, if we start with the spin coater then spin coater uh, or spin coating is a procedure to deposit the thin film uniformly on a flat surface. Generally, we go for a, a photo resist coating. So, uh, and, and there are several things that we need to understand first is that it is the easiest method to deposit a film. So, what you do is you take a you take a spin coater right you load the wafer there is a vacuum chuck which will hold the wafer and you spin this uh, wafer right at a given rotations per minute. So, you load the solution and you spin it on the substrate right this can be a silicon substrate. So, loading silicon substrate onto a spin coater which has here a vacuum right and you are rotating at certain rotations per minute will yield you a thin film. But what we need to understand is that uh, the thickness of this film depends on several factors again in this case the first and foremost as you may have guessed is the angular speed rotations per minute. If the rotations per minute is higher the film where the film thickness is lower. Second is viscosity of the liquid if the film is viscous then the thickness is higher. Next is concentration of the solution right. Then common spin coating defects what kind of defects you will observe you can see defect 1. 2, 3 and 4 right. So, what are these 4 defects? So, bubbles or pinholes right you can see here then you have swirling or stick pattern you can see here then you have non uniform coating you can see here and finally, chuck mark you can see this one right. So, these are some of the defects that may occur while depositing the thin film using spin coating technique. Limitations of spin coating. Now, the advantage is like it is very easy. What are limitations? Low throughput, one substrate at a time, you cannot use more than one substrate. Control over the deposition process and layer thickness is very poor. Uniformity of the deposition film is very poor compared to other techniques, right. So, that is uh, about the uh, spin coater. Now, uh, in CVD we have seen 4 basic types of CVD like in PVD there are 4 uh, categories, in CVD also there are 4 categories basic 4 categories. The first one we call is the atmospheric pressure CVD and the advantages of it is high deposition rates, uh, simple high throughput, but the disadvantages are poor uniformity, purity is less than LP CVD. The low pressure CVD is a second type of uh, uh, CVD in which uh, we have the excellent uniformity and purity, the disadvantages is lower deposition rates than APCVD. MOCVD is a uh, uh, the it is a full form is metal organic chemical vapor deposition. Here the advantage is highly flexible can deposit semiconductors, metals, dielectrics 
disadvantage and limitations are it is highly toxic, very expensive source material, environmental deposition cost are really high. So, uh, APCVD is used for thick oxide deposition, LPCVD is used for polysilicon deposition, MOCVD is used for low cost optical or uh, 3 to 5 technology, PCVD which is plasma enhanced chemical depo deposition uh, in which the plasmas are used to force reaction and that would not be possible at low temperature. Uh, the advantages of PCVD is, is low use low temperatures necessary for back end processing. This is the biggest advantage of PCVD and we will see that at certain point of time you have to go for PCVD instead of other CVD techniques. The limitation is that there can be a physical uh, plasma damage uh, may result uh, you know uh, uh, to damage the film and uh, also used for dielectric coatings that is advantage actually the uh, that PECVD can be used to deposit silicon dioxide, silicon nitride and so on. So, if you want to see you or see the CVD at a glance then you know that there is a uh, there is a chamber right either this is the uh, vertical tube furnace. Uh, or, or it is a horizontal tube furnace in fact, not vertical. Vertical tube furnace will come uh, in this particular form right. Horizontal tube furnace is this one. So, this is a horizontal tube furnace and then uh, within that furnace we can load the uh, wafers. These red lines are all wafers and uh, then there are heating coils because you need to go for very high temperature. The material that is used for this horizontal tube furnace is quads. Uh, the gas is uh, gas enters through one side and gas leaves on other side while the it, uh, it there is a reaction on the surface of the wafers right. Now, the next step is that when the gas uh, uh, you know phase reaction occurs what happens. So, there is a adsorption right then so there is transport of surface and uh, transport to surface and then there is adsorption, then there is a readsorption, there is a surface diffusion, finally there is a desorption and desorption it can again go, go out through the as a byproduct right. So, absorb gas phase reactions, what are reactions? First is transport to surface, then there is a absorption on the surface, there is a surface diffusion. So, the, uh, this film will form, there are some of the readsorption and then, then remaining are the uh, nucleation and step growth occurs and the deabsorption also or desorption also forms. Okay. Now, uh, the, uh, so the point is in a, simp in a simplified model right as gas flows over the substrate film growth is determined by adsorption and the reaction rates. So, in reality deposition rate is affected by several factors. The first one is the distance from gas inlet, second one is specifics of the reactions, third one is radial variance and the tricks to improve this uniformity are multiple. The first one is single wafer processing. Uh, if you go for one wafer at a time then you can have a better deposition, increase temperature along the substrate and tilt the substrate into the flow. That means that if you have a tilted substrate right like this then the reaction would be better. So, uh, there are a lot of equations that will govern this particular stuff. Uh, we will not go into that because I want to give you an example of different kind of techniques and then we will actually go into how to fabricate some of the devices. So, many gases used in CVD systems, uh, systems are toxic uh, that is hazardous or to humans. It, they are corrosive in nature, flammable and uh, explosive or pyrophoric right that is spontaneously, spontaneously burn or explode in air moisture or when exposed to oxygen. So, uh, in terms of gas hazard flammable limits and exposure limit uh, you can see this table right from ammonia, silane, arsine, phosphine, hydrogen, nitrogen oxide, hydrogen chloride, diborane and dichlorosilane. There are several hazards that are involved and the, the corresponding flammable limits and exposure limits are also given in the table. So, let us now understand uh, how to quickly fabricate a micro needle right or a electrode or a probe with several electrodes integrated onto it. So, before we understand it let us uh, let us understand a bit on the lithography. So, what I will do is I will just uh, create a separate slides right and I will teach you a little bit about lithography. So, you do not uh, miss out the important point. So, we are talking about lithography.
right and in lithography we are talking about photolithography. Okay, photolithography. So, lithography uh, stands for carving from single stone, but here we are using photons which is light to create different structures. So, I will give you certain certain examples. Okay. So, let us start with one two different examples. These are two different masks. What are this? Mask M A S K mask okay. and uh, this mask has this pattern this mask has an opposite pattern. What do you mean opposite pattern that all the lines that you see right this structure is completely dark is completely dark assume that it is completely dark and this one is transparent all right. In this one this structure is completely dark and this one is transparent. So, uh, this mask mask 1 let us say mask 1 this is mask 2 mask 1 is called bright field mask. Mask 2 is called dark field mask what is it bright field mask and dark field mask. All right, you understood this much bright field mask and dark field mask. Now, let us delete everything hmm. and I will show you an example of how this mask will help us to pattern different materials onto a substrate. Hmm. It is very easy, very easy, but very important because uh, photolithography is considered as a heart of microengineering techniques. So, let us draw. So, if I take a silicon wafer, right? This is a silicon wafer. This is a primary flat, primary flat, and there can be a secondary flat, or there may not be a secondary flat, depending on. So, this is a secondary flat, right? Primary flat, secondary flat. Depending on the primary flat and secondary flat, the the wafers are identified as one zero zero or 1 1 1 right they are identified as p type or or n type ok. So, uh, let us not worry about the type of the wafers at this point of time uh, the point of showing you this particular uh, image is that if I take a cross section if I take a cross section of this it is this one right. So, this is my silicon wafer all right. Now, before before we again go further let me just quickly explain you the mask versus the photoregist. So, one thing we have seen is a mask right bright field and dark field. Second thing we need to understand is a photoregist photo resist. Photoregist are of two types positive photoregist or negative photoregist positive photoregist or negative photoregist. Now, I will spin code this photoregist onto this substrate right spin code this photoregist onto a silicon substrate and let us understand it is a positive photoregist alright. Now, the point of lithography or how to perform lithography or steps of lithography are you spin code. So, first is spin code photoregist second is soft bake soft bake third is load mask fourth is exposure exposure of what ultraviolet light fifth is develop photoregist sixth is hard bake all right. These are the steps you remember first step is spin coat the photoregist using what spin coater soft bake soft bake generally is done at 90 degree centigrade for 1 minute on hot plate 
okay. mask you have seen either there can be a bright field mask or there can be a dark field mask right. Photo resist develop uh, for positive or negative photo resist are different. Hard bake is done at 120 degree centigrade for 1 minute on hot plate ok easy. So, what are the steps spin coat, soft bake, load mask, exposure, developer and hard bake remember remember ok I am deleting it from here. So, you remember So, now what we have done we have taken a silicon wafer and we have coated a photo resist. So, let us assume it is a positive photo resist photo resist are of two types positive and negative correct ok. So, we remember this one also ok. So, the next step is next step is what is the next step after spin coating photo resist you soft bake it right soft bake at 90 degree for 1 minute on hot plate right after soft bake next step is you load the mask. So, I loaded the mask what kind of mask bright field mask right bright field mask. The, so, if I if this is again cross section of a mask right if I draw the top view this will look like this ok. So, if I take a cross section cross section sorry right then it will look like this correct. So, this is a bright field mask after bright field mask next step is you expose this wafer to UV light after exposing the wafer you have to unload the wafer unload the wafer and unload and dip wafer unload the mask ok unload the mask you do not unload the wafer then unload the mask and dip wafer wafer is what the substrate right. Generally we use silicon so I say silicon wafer alright. So, dip substrate or wafer in photo resist developer right. So, spin coat positive photo resist soft bake at 90 degree for 1 minute on hot plate then load the mask then UV exposure then unload the mask and dip the wafer in photo resist developer right. Next step after this what is the next step unload the mask and dip wafer into photo resist developer next step is. So, when you do this when you do this what you will get you know you will have you have pattern the photo resist right. After this next step is hard bake hard bake hard bake is done at 120 degree centigrade for 1 minute on hot plate 120 1 minute on hot plate right. This is what kind of photo resist positive photo resist. So, what you are getting here what you are getting you are getting that if there is a positive photo resist then whatever the pattern is there on the mask same pattern you can transfer to your substrate. But in case of negative photo resist whatever the pattern there is on the mask opposite pattern will come on the substrate. So, if you see the uh, slide what I mean is 
So, this is for positive photoresist right what you get is this one. Hmm. Now, let us understand negative photoresist negative photoresist. So, same process I take a wafer I coat the wafer with a photoresist this time it is negative photoresist next is I will spin uh, after coating the wafer I will perform soft bake is done as 90 degree centigrade 1 minute hot plate. Next step is load the mask what kind of mask we have we have a bright field mask bright field mask after this loading the bright field mask bright field mask the next step is you have to expose the wafer with uv light with uv light this is your substrate then unload the mask and develop photoresist right unload the mask and develop photoresist by dipping the wafer in photoresist developer right by dipping the wafer in photoresist developer. If you do that what you will get you, you guys can tell I told you right earlier that absolutely opposite pattern you will get you will see if you if you consider the previous case you see this one and mask was same consider this case you see here the photoresist is intact on the area which was not exposed the photoresist got edge on the area which was exposed the photoresist is intact is solid this is your negative photoresist. In this case you have a positive photoresist you have a positive photoresist in positive photoresist the area which is not exposed is stronger. In negative photoresist the area which is not exposed which is this area the area which is not exposed by UV light is weaker you can see here right. So, now you understand difference between positive and negative photoresist right. Now, let us take an example of we change the mask ok everything is same we change the mask and then I will quickly tell you why we are looking at all these things because we are interested in understanding how to fabricate a micro needle and then possibly the flexible uh, micro electrode array and understand it further. So, if I take a uh, dark field mask in this case uh, earlier we used to use bright field mask let us understand now if, if you have a dark field mask. So, if you see the screen uh, and I have this design, but all this area that I am drawing with the lines are completely dark ok completely dark and this area is transparent this area is is opaque right transparent and opaque. What is this kind of mask dark field mask right. In this case what will happen let us see we have a photoresist we coat the photoresist with a neg positive photo uh, let us say positive photoresist we this is a silicon wafer this is a photoresist that is coated onto silicon wafer which is positive photoresist. On this we will load a mask if I take a cross section of this mask then it will be like this.
right. What we have? We have a dark field mask, we have a dark field mask. Hmm? What kind of photoresist we had? Positive photoresist, positive photoresist. So, if I expose this wafer with UV light and then I develop unload the mask and develop the wafer, unload the mask and develop the wafer, what I will have? This is a positive photoresist. So, my photoresist will stay in this region, you see because the area which is not exposed is stronger, area not exposed to UV is stronger in positive photoresist, but area which is not exposed gets weaker, right area which is not exposed to UV will get weaker in negative photoresist very simple. So, because the area which is not exposed gets stronger you can retain the positive photoresist this region the silicon is here right. So, this is how the lithography works right. So, the point is whether you are going for a, a bright film mask or you are going for dark film mask. Uh, it all depends on the photoresist that you are using. So, uh, depending on the photoresist that you may have, you can select a positive or negative photoresist. Uh, depending on the sorry mask that you have, you can select a positive or negative photoresist. Again, for a bright film mask, light and dark film mask, uh, it is not that if you use bright film mask, always you have to go for positive photoresist or dark film mask, you have to go for negative photoresist. It depends on the process that you are going to select. So, let us take an example of uh, such a process and here is one of the process. So, what we have done is you take a silicon wafer then you have your oxidized silicon which is blue color is uh, uh, oxide oxide deposited by PECVD you know what is PECVD plasma ions chemical vapor deposition uh, and then uh, uh, what we are doing next one is we are coating titanium and gold. So, titanium is used to improve the addition of gold then you pattern this titanium gold in a certain fashion then you, you protect this uh, area with uh, another silicon dioxide which is your uh, you're depositing using PECVD. So, you can see in this case D it is protected then you open only the area which you want to take the contacts these are your electrodes. Finally, you can uh, do the DRI which is called deep reactive ion etching DRI to form this pit and then you can you can go all the way through to create your or, or actually you can this DRI is not required in this case because you want to just remove silicon dioxide in this particular case uh, which is case number F. So, to etch silicon dioxide we are using buffer hydrofluoric acid or BHF. So, uh, you use photoresist. So, so uh, again uh, how you get this particular thing how you get this because we are loading a wafer we are loading a wafer uh, with a mask which is a bright field mask having this pattern. like this right I will just give you an example ok. So, that you can get this kind of pattern right. So, what we are doing again I am repeating we have taken a silicon wafer on which this blue color thing is oxide thus this is silicon dioxide this is silicon dioxide on this you have your titanium gold which is patterned using photolithography as I have earlier taught you how to do it you can you can spin code photoresist on it photoresist and then on photoresist after doing soft bake you load the mask mask will look having pattern like this 1 2 3 1 2 3 right and then since it is a bright field mask the area which is not exposed which uh, would be stronger the, the photoresist below below this particular region uh, will be stronger and the photoresist where the area is exposed will get weaker right. Then, then you can do the hard bake 
and you can then etch the titanium gold from the area which is not protected by photoresist. So, what will happen is if I do this particular process my photoresist will stay in this region and from other regions photoresist will get stripped off photoresist will get stripped off. Okay. So, this is my positive photoresist and this is my gold uh, which is titanium gold right. After this I strip of the photoresist, stripping of the photoresist can be in acetone. You dip the wafer in acetone and you can strip of the photoresist. When you strip of the photoresist, you get this particular thing which is D and uh, not really D, but you what you will have is this particular stuff like this and then then what you do is you do PECVD to grow silicon dioxide as you can see in D. After that you remove silicon dioxide from certain region where you want to take the uh, measure the signals uh, which you can see here. After that you etch silicon dioxide again using the uh, photolithography and then finally you go for DRI, finally you go for deep reactive ion etching. Okay easy. Now, if you do that what you have is this particular uh, probe with multiple electrodes and you can use this probe for measuring several signals in the brain. Let us take another example, uh, here we have a flexible substrate micro electrode array. So, you start with a silicon wafer, you load a polymide or spin coated polymide which is shown in orange color, then on that you have your titanium gold. Uh, and then on the titanium gold you pattern the titanium gold using photolithography then form oxide using PECVD which is green color silicon dioxide as you can see in D. Then you have uh, your E where you are again etching silicon dioxide from the area where you want to record the signal from the area where you want to record the signal you see here and here right. And then what you do is after that you create uh, you remove uh, PI from this particular region and then you can st uh, strip off this PI from the wafer and you will have a, a flexible device as shown in figure here. So, these are 32 electrodes uh, micro electrode array and um, uh, all this thing is completely covered with silicon dioxide this entire thing is completely covered except these dots all these dots that you can see with label 1 to 32 they are not covered with silicon dioxide and what is dot made up of dot is made up of a metal which is your chrome gold or titanium gold and that means that you can acquire the signal uh, through this uh, electrode and you can place this electrode onto the rat's brain to understand your ECOG signal. So, there are several kind of devices that one can see I am not going into detail because it is very complicated this itself can be a course. So, just running through the slides may be in one of the course where we go into detail I will be teaching this fabrication process in detail. So, 1 shank versus 3 shank versus 4 shank versus 8 shank uh, uh, different uh, electrodes are used for different regions here this particular region is uh, hippocampus and then if you want to acquire the signal this is a schematic where you can load the micro electrode array onto the rat's brain and you can acquire the signal this signal are ECOG signal since we are taking the signals from the brain rather than scalp and this is an actual schematic of what we do in the lab right uh, uh, with Dr. Vikas and uh, that is why uh, Dr. Vikas wanted to teach about how this uh, uh, engineers how engineers would be benefited of understanding the neural science and uh, uh, you can see here that once uh, we operate the rat right we do the craniotomy we can we can uh, we can uh, open the dura and we can place the device onto rat's brain which is a uh, we have to cover it with the dental cement we we take the signals from the electrodes that is micro electrode array which i have shown it to you earlier which is uh, 32 uh, channel array 32 electrode array and then from there we connect it to the equation system to measure different signals. So, these are 32 signals acquired from all 32 electrodes you have to see that uh, the left side uh, or the y axis is, uh, is the 
uh, voltage and x axis is time, time is in seconds and voltage is in micro volts. You can see here it is 200 micro volts and second is about 5 seconds, but when we go for an epilepsy by creating or by giving a drug to red's brain, then you can see that there is a seizure uh, in several electrodes and uh, here the value is 3000 micro volts. So, what was the value here? 200 micro volts which is normal e ECOG signals versus 3000 micro volts because of the creation of the uh, epilepsy and these are the seizures right. Now, if you load the anti epileptic drug onto rat's brain uh, or you administer the AED into the rat, then you can recover the signal and this is again in hundreds of micro volts. That means that we can understand the efficacy of a drug of an anti epileptic drug using this particular uh, flexible device onto the rat's brain and thus we have a, a, a model to test different kind of drugs which is here in this case is used for understanding or treating epilepsy right. But we can also use the different kind of drugs uh, for, for understanding different kind of uh, uh, efficacy or we, we can understand different efficacy of drug for certain applications related to brain. Uh, but let us stick to epilepsy only. So, what we have done is not only you have created or we have created together 32 electrodes, but also we have acquired the signals with ECOG, we have created an epilepsy and then we have understood the AED uh, whether the AED is useful or not, AED stands for anti epileptic drugs right. So, this is further the uh, uh, understanding of the uh, you, what you can see here is A, B and C. So, the first one A is a baseline, B is epileptic signals and C is a anti epileptic drug effect. Uh, then we, we can see the power spectrum of the baseline, we can see the spectrogram of the uh, uh, spectrogram of the baseline and finally, we can see the power spectrum for 10 seconds recording after 4 minutes of AD right uh, uh, and then finally, C 3 shows the spectrogram of 10 second recording 4 minutes after the anti epileptic drug administration. So, so, this is how uh, we, we can see um, how the how the things are done and how we can use this 32 channel electrode for acquiring different signals and to study the effect of AED. So, with that guys I will stop it here, I hope you understand a bit on the microfabrication technology since uh, we are focusing on, 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 on neural engineering right and to understand how the brain works for its anatomy right. Uh, I am not stressing too much on the engineering part, but I am giving a, a kind of a peripheral view to understand that how uh, uh, process technologies or microfabrication technologies can be used to study different signals uh, in the brain and not only different signals where we can create or design a fabric or fabricate a micro electrode array and we can also fabricate a single versus uh, a, you know array of uh, micro probes with electrodes indicated onto it which can be used not only for acquiring signals deep within the brain, but can alternatively use to get the give the electrical stimulation which we call as a deep brain stimulation. Uh, here we have taken example of epilepsy, but the same electrodes can be also used for understanding uh, Parkinson and, and treating Parkinson to an extent. So, uh, I hope that you understood a bit on this uh, I, I and then if you have any questions uh, as you know you can always ask uh, in the NPTEL forum, we will very happy to answer uh, questions around these topics and uh, all the best for your exam. Thank you.